Okay, so let's start. So that's uh, kind of the last stretch of the semester. Uh, and before we start, let me just remind you a few things. So, so uh, projects. So I guess you all know this. I think I talked with almost all the teams, but not quite all. So if you haven't talked to me, you still have a chance today, tomorrow. Uh, uh, the project will be presented next week, so we're going to start earlier, just outside of this room. Even if you're not uh, doing a project, if you're a 419 student, please come see what projects uh, are there. Uh, final reports are only due on the last day of the exam period, but the videos are due a day before, so we'll have time to actually watch them. I do suggest that you at least prepare the video, or at least the first draft before the post session, so you'll know what you, can, what you have to say. The, you will have a very, very short time to say what you have to say. We have 35 projects. We allocated three hours. Do the math. It basically means three, three minutes uh, per project. And all the TAs and me are going to go around, and, uh, and hopefully you will also go around the other projects and get an impression of what's, uh, what you've done. Um, homework five, the last one will be released today. It will cover uh, what we're doing uh, today and on Wednesday, and a few uh, things from the past, just to kind of remind you um, what we've done earlier. It's, it's much shorter, uh, no, no, uh, no programming, basically just theory. Shouldn't take that long of a time, but the the due date is also uh, coming uh, up quickly. Okay, reminding you about the exam. I didn't know where it is last time. Now we know. It's in town 100. Uh, nothing else is new. Questions. It's the same, it's uh, two names for the same place. That's my understanding, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so, so where are we? So, so um, we talked about Bayesian learning, we talked about uh, what does it mean to be Bayesian, and we gave really two algorithms, uh, Naive Bayes, which is one important representative of this approach, and a family of algorithms in, in EM, um, where the idea was uh, to think about semi-supervised or unsupervised learning, basically learning with, with hidden variables or missing variables. Um, so today I want to extend this and move to think about how to represent arbitrary probability distributions. Uh, and this will uh, give rise to two computational problems. Inference, basically how to compute the probability of events, uh, and how to learn, how to learn representation of probability distributions. Um, so this is the setting that we have, and, and we talked about it already last time. So we have uh, as input n plus one tuples. At the end of last time, we discussed briefly uh, with this input, basically two paradigms, and kind of compared and contrasted what you can get if you want to think about this as uh, a, from the discriminative learning perspective and from the generative learning perspective. Um, of course, this depends on what you expect you'll see when you're going to use this probability distribution. But today, we're basically going to say that all we see is data, there's no notion of a class label. Um, and we see examples, and we want to know something about the data. We want to know correlation between domain, we, uh, between variables. We want to know the probability of some events, given perhaps some evidence. Some variables are assigned values, and some are not. And we want to know what's the probability uh, of assigning them certain values. Or maybe you want to know the most likely assignment to a set of variables. So um, 
uh, that, that's the type of problem that we're going to address today. And we actually have seen an instance of this, right? So we talked about naive ways. Uh, and if you think about it, we kind of solved this problem um, in a specific setting, right? So uh, here we made the assumption that uh, we called one of the n plus one variables y. And we made the assumption that given y, the x i's are independent. And under that, uh, we figured out uh, what are the probabilities that we have to estimate in order to know all the distribution. And we actually realized that under this uh, assumption, and I'm writing it here explicitly, p of x i given x j and y is p of x i given y. Now notice that um, I just called y. Uh, I, I made y uh, special, but I could have made any other variable special. The important thing is that uh, we made some independent assumptions that saved us uh, a lot of computation and also made the representation of this probability distribution small. Uh, by small, I mean the number of parameters we have to estimate in this case is just linear in the number of variables. Um, so in general, this is this is insufficient. We want to be able to represent more uh, expressive probability distribution, and today we're going to make one step toward that uh, and think about more general probability distributions. For example, in the simple case that we dealt with, the naive base one, given this assumption, we know everything about the probability distribution. That has to be clear, right? So even though we thought about it as a classifier, and we know how to compute p of y given an assignment, really, you know everything. Every event that is given to you, by event I mean any subset of variables with assignment that is given to you, you can compute the probability of this event. Um, because we know how to compute the joint. So I'm showing here uh, the joint probability distribution. Uh, P of y, x1, x2 up to xn, we know that we can write it this way. And again, I could have, I didn't have to put y outside here. I could have chosen any other xi to put outside as long as I know these marginals, the corresponding marginals. So I just distinguish y. But that means that now if I give you an event like this, P of x1 being 0, x2 being 0, y being 1, you can also compute the probability of this event. How would you do this? Right, so that's already using the uh, assumption, and we'll wait with that a second. In principle, this is always true, that if you know the joint probability distribution and you want a specific event, you can compute, even without any assumptions. Right, because you can marginalize. This is an important term that I assume you've seen already, but uh, we'll see it again. We can marginalize over all the variables. So I can also write it as a sum over all possible assignments to those variables that are not listed here, uh, x3, x3, x4, x5 up to xn can be something. And I'm fixing y to be 1, x1 to be 0, x2 to be 0, as is said here on the left. And this is the probability of this event, right? So sum over all assignments fixing x1, y, and x2. That's always true, OK? Everyone agrees with that? Now, and so that's a general statement. You know the joint. You know how to compute an event for each at the probability of each event. Now, specifically, as you say, in this case, we have assumptions. So I don't need to do this. This is actually expensive, right? So how many elements are in this sum? Two to the n minus two, right? Because there are 
n plus 1 variables, three of them are given. So I'm left with n minus 2 variables. Each one can take 0 or 1. So I have 2 to the n minus 2 options here. For all reasonable values of n, I don't want to do a sum over so many uh, components, right? So that's not a realistic way of doing it uh, when n is large enough. That's why we make assumptions. So specifically here, we know that it's, we made this independent assumption that are listed here. Xi and Xj are independent given y, and therefore I can write this event as P uh, of X1 being 0, X2 being 0 given y times P of y. And I can decompose this to P of X1 given y, P of X2 given y, P of y. Simple. Um, so that's the case of the simple distribution. Uh, and hopefully you're convinced that we can do this for any event. Um, now our goal is to move out of the simple assumption and generalize it a little bit. I want to be able to represent more expressive joint probability distribution over a set of random variables. Uh, and you know there are many ways to represent a probability distribution. The simplest way might be uh, a table. Right, so if I have n variables, I can represent it as a table that for each instance provides the weight of this instance. Right, that's a representation of a probability distribution. It provides the complete uh, information, only that it's too large. Right, there are 2 to the n assignments, which means 2 to the n minus 1 numbers, because they have to sum to 1. So one of the assignments, I don't need to give it away. Uh, but that's typically uninteresting. So what we're going to do is we're going to come up with other representations of probability distribution um, and that are smaller, that do not require exponentially many parameters. Uh, and in order to do this, you really need to make assumptions. Uh, so there are many languages that people have used uh, to represent probability distribution. Uh, here are some of them. Uh, multilinear polynomials. So, so distribution are just functions, right? Function with some properties. The sum uh, of the value of the distribution over all assignment has to be one. But other than that, it's a function. So you can write it as a multilinear polynomial, or which are basically multinomials um, uh, over variables. And this is actually sometimes a very useful representation of distributions. Has some nice properties. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, we're going to talk about base nets uh, as the representation of probability distributions. Base nets is a very expressive language of distributions. Um, also has some very nice properties, nice algorithms, and perhaps uh, the most commonly used representation of at least discrete probability distributions. Uh, and that's, that's the, uh, what we're going to do. So base nets are basically directed acyclic graphs uh, that hide, uh, not hide actually, that express independence assumption on a set of variables. So this is what we have, right? So it represents a joint probability distribution over a set of variables. And the graph actually is just a language that tells us what are the independence assumptions uh, that are there. And the independence assumption is for every variable x, x is independent of its non-descendants given its parents, all its parents. That's it. So, so if you look at it here, z is a parent of x. Uh, in fact, z is the only parent of x. So given z, x is going to be independent, for example, of y and uh, all other variables in this case. X is a descendant of Y, uh, and therefore you cannot say that X is independent of Y um, without additional uh, assumptions. Um, so given that we make this assumption, we can now take the, jo the joint probability distribution and factor it. Uh, given that Y is the only uh, variable here that has no parents, it's going to be P of Y times the product 
of all these conditional probabilities, p of xi given the parent of xi. Uh, and really, this is a theorem, right? So I'm basically, uh, I started to write the joint and decomposed it using Bayes' rule, uh, and then simplified it using this assumption. So you should be able to write this down to yourself, following exactly what we've done when we did naive Bayes, only that now a variable might have multiple <coughs> parents, and therefore I'm leaving this as a set, parents of xi. Uh, these terms, parent of x, probability of xi given parent of xi, is something that is called CPTs for conditional probability tables. And these tables completely define the probability distribution. So essentially, for every variable and a group of its parents, so for example, uh, x10 here with z2, x, I was wrong before that I said that z is the only parent, x has many parents, x and the set of its parents will be a conditional probability table. X2 will have also two parents and so on. Um, as a simple exercise, if you want to think about this, you can think about this very simple uh, base net. What I have here is just three variables. Z goes to Y, Y goes to X. And you can think about the independence assumption in this context. So in this case, uh, what you're going to be able to show that the probability of x given y and z is the probability of x given y. So I don't need to know z once I know y. Now, independence is a symmetric condition. So again, you should be able to uh, do some algebra and show that you can also show it in the other direction. So p of z given y and x is p of z given y. So these are all immediate outcomes of this independent assumption. And now with this, we should be able to do a lot of things once we have this uh, representation. So just to uh, reiterate what do we mean, what is the semantics of this directed acyclic graph? So nodes are random variables. Edges, you can think about it as, as causal influences. Uh, so in this case, you know, y influences x, z influences y on, on this base net uh, on your right. Um, and each node is associated with a con one conditional probability table, conditional probability distribution, basically its probability given all its parents. So, so really you can think about this as essentially a representation of a set of conditional probability, uh, conditional independence assumptions about the distribution. So while in naive base everything was very simple, you had one uh, template for the independence assumption. Here you have many, and they are, they, you can read them immediately uh, from the graph. Um, OK, so let, let's take a, a more interesting example. So we're going to model this story. A burglar alarm in your house rings when there is a burglary or when there is an earthquake. An earthquake will be reported on the radio. If an alarm rings and your neighbors hear it, they will call it. So we're going to uh, define a base net that models this. So what are, what are going to be the random variables? We're going to have this as random variable, earthquake. All of them are going to be Boolean, yes or no, burglary, yes or no, alarm, radio, and your neighbor's call, John and Mary call. Uh, now, the story itself dictates what kind of assumptions we want to make or what is the structure that we're going to impose, the graphical structure that we're going to impose on this uh, set of variables. So if there's an earthquake, you'll probably hear about it on the radio. Uh, an alarm can ring because of a burglary or an earthquake. And if your neighbors hear an alarm, they will call you. So that's my suggested graphical model. OK? So any questions on this? That's a sensible, yeah. So do we go just up to the parent, or can we go up all the way to the answer? When we're triggering like a conditional probability, like you say John,
Of course, yeah. Okay, so if you, go, okay. you will have to go all up, but you will have to account for uh, the independence. And, and we're going to try to do this uh, a little bit later. Yeah. Um, so what you know now is that given alarm, uh, John is independent of, of Berger. Right? But, uh, but there's a lot of dependencies here still. Uh, so let's, let's try to write down the, the John probability distribution. This will partly answer your question. In order to do this, we have to complete uh, this. We still don't know what is the probability distribution here. We just have a structure. Uh, we need some parameters. So uh, how many parameters do we need? Or maybe let's start. How many parameters um, do we have originally if all you know is that you have six variables, right, before I put this structure? How many parameters do I need to define a probability distribution over six Boolean variables? Sixty-three is a suggestion here. Why sixty-three? Basically, it's two to the six, right? So, so I have two to the six assignments to these six variables. Each one has a weight. Uh, they sum to one, so two to the six minus one is the number of parameters I need in general to represent a probability distribution over six Boolean variables. Now, once I add the arrows, this number is going to go down. So let's think about how many parameters do I need now. So, for example, uh, so each variable is going to be associated with a conditional probability distribution. Okay? So, Mary has one parent. How many numbers do I need for the conditional probability P of Mary calls given alarm? So Mary has two values. Alarm has two values. So I need to represent P of Mary calls given alarm, yes. And then P of Mary does not call given alarm, yes. But these two numbers sum to one. So there are two numbers, really I need one. And then the same thing I need to do given no alarm. P of Mary calls given no alarm. P of Mary doesn't call given no alarm. So it's four numbers, but really two independent numbers. So, so let's count everything. So four numbers for this. Similarly for John has one parent, so it's four numbers. What about alarm here? I have to have a conditional probability distribution for alarm given its parents, earthquake and burglary. So earthquake and burglary take, take two values, which means two variables which take four values, right? So it could be yes, 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 no, no, yes, and no, no. And in each case, I need to know what is the probability of alarm. So alarm can be zero given each of the four cases, or one given each of the four cases. But these two sum to one. So altogether, in this case, I have eight numbers. OK, so I have eight numbers here. Uh, here I will have also four numbers, because it's a single parent, four and four. So, so far I have 20 numbers. What about the roots here? These have no parents, so I can think about it just as prior. So, I do have a probability of earthquake and probability of no earthquake, two numbers. And the same for burglary, other two numbers, P of yes burglary or no burglary. So, four no, more numbers, altogether 24 numbers without counting the fact that I can omit some due to some probabilities sum to one. So I went down from 64 numbers to 24 numbers because I made independence assumptions. 
Okay, so I cannot represent now all probability distributions given this graph, but I think that I can represent all interesting probability distributions for this case because these are reasonable independent assumptions for this case. Questions? Yeah. So the only variables that are truly independent here are earthquake and burglary? What do you mean independent? Yeah. yeah. So, so earthquake is independent of burglary. But uh, so, so we are, as we did in naive ways or, and, and before, we have to always distinguish between independence and conditional independence. It's true that earthquake and burglary are independent. But they are not independent conditioning on alarm, for example. Okay? So these are two different uh, conditions. Okay? Um, okay, so, so there's a lot of uh, tricky issues here. I mean, it's not as simple as it looks. Uh, and there are procedures and conditions to kind of giving a new one, a, a Bayesian network to determine what are the independence of kind of two variables to, that, that are in the graph that we're not going to discuss in details. Um, but that's what we went through before, right? So we, we talked about what is needed in order to determine the joint probability distribution. We need P of E and P of B, because these don't have parents, two values each. We need P of R given E, P of M given A, P of J given A. And we have one node that has two parents. Uh, we need P of alarm given E and B. This is the larger uh, or the largest uh, conditional probability table that we have here. All together, they define the probability distribution. Right, so, um, and that's it. We don't need more conditional probability uh, distributions other than this. And with this, I can now write the joint. So I can say, okay, you want to know P of E, B, A, R, M, J. I should be able to factor it and write it in terms of this joint. So let, let's, let's just do it. This is just a simple, it's not the only way to do it, by the way. I mean, you can go many ways from this joint here to a factor distribution. Here is just one. So what do I know? So I can always write P of E, B, A, R, M, J as P of E times P of the rest given E. Um, now let's copy P of E here and do the same for B. So I can write it as P of B given all the rest given E and B times P of B. So again, I'm copying P of E, I'm copying P of B. Uh, what can I say here? I can take R out. Where is R here? R is here. So I can take R. Now R is, uh, I can write P of R given EB times P of MJA, I should have written given E, B, and R, but you can see that M, J, and A are independent, M, J, and A are independent of R given E and B. So I don't need to add R here. Let's just copy again. We have P of E, P of B. P of R given E, B. I can rewrite it. What can I write instead of P of R? given E and B. Uh, R is independent of B given E, right? Which is his parent. So instead of P of R given E, B, I copy it here as just P of R given E. Uh, and this I rewrite as P of M, J given A, E, B times P of A given E, B. Again, I'm, continue, I'm copying the first three here. Uh, now, let's look at M and J given A, E, B. M and J. Now, M and J are independent given A. So I can decompose this 
to be P of M given A, P of J given A. In fact, I could have written, I could have carried E and B here also, but I already omitted them because given A, I don't care about E and B. So from this, I got this, the product here. And here I have P of A given E B. So basically, I decomposed it. Now, notice that I know all this, right? I know P of E and P of B. These are this conditional probability. I know P of R given E. I know P of M given A. Uh, where is it? M given A, J given A, and A given E and B. Now, what do I mean when I say I know? Uh, these are multiple numbers, right? So given an assignment to these, you'll choose the appropriate values from this conditional probability distribution. Huh? So this is still written in a parameterized way without a specific number. Questions on this? Okay, so all we've done here is we've just, we've done some algebra to show that basically it's an instance of the theorem that I uh, quoted before that if you give me these independent assumptions, I can always write the join uh, as a product of all the conditional probability tables. We just instantiate it in this case. Now, in general, you're going to have some computational problems. Uh, one of them is going to be, what is the structure of the network? In this case, we took a story and we just wrote it down. This used to be the standard way of dealing with base nets. Uh, whenever we cared about small base nets, a small number of variables, this was a useful way uh, to do things. If you care now about a large number of variables, this is probably not applicable. Uh, you want to be able to learn the structure uh, from data once the probability, once the variables are defined. So we want to talk about learning the structure. Of course, we want to learn also about learning the parameters. Once you have a structure, uh, you want to be able to learn the parameter. This, is, this turns out to be a much, much easier problem than learning uh, the structure. Uh, and we're going to talk about learning a structure of the base net where the answer to this should be easy for you now. What should be the guiding principles? And how do we decide whether one structure is better than another? We're going to use the maximum likelihood principle. Basically, we're going to look at two structures and be able to compute the likelihood of the structure given uh, the data and choose the one that is most likely. So, so we're going to get to this at the end today or next time. For now, we want to think about uh, the computational, pro the underlying computational problems here are two, inference, uh, or sometimes called reasoning, is actually there are two problems here. One of them is computing the probability of an event. I'm going to give you an event, which is an assignment to a set of variables a subset of all the variables. So in the case here, it could be that I'm going to give you the probability of E being 1, being, B being 1, and R being 1. And I'm going to ask you, what's the probability of this? Uh, and in general, this problem is, is very hard computationally. It's sharply complete, so it's harder than NP complete. Uh, for people that know something about this, if you think about satisfiability, uh, finding a satisfying assignment of a CNF formula as an archetypical NP-complete problem. A uh, Sharpie complete problem is counting the number of satisfying assignments of a CNF formula, which is a much harder problem. Uh, and one can show that computing the probability of an event in BaseNet is equivalent to this problem. Um, so it's hard. And the second, maybe even more interesting, uh, computational inference problem is find the most likely explanation or the most likely assignment. Um, the name of this changed with time. Used to be uh, MAP, now it's called MPE. Uh, basically the idea here is that you're given some variables and you're asked 
what is the most likely assignment to the other variables that you have not observed. Uh, and this is an, also an NPR problem. So basically, inference in BaseNet is a hard problem, hard computational problems. We still need to do it. Uh, and there are several algorithms uh, that are being used. Uh, for exact inference, the key algorithm that is being used is something that is called variable elimination uh, and some variations of it. We're going to talk a little bit about it. And in many cases, because the problem is computationally hard, we have to resort to approximate inference. And a key representative for this is, is Gibbs sampling. So we're going to say a little bit uh, something uh, about these, uh, these two. Um, now, before we go to the general case, we're going to care more about uh, a very specific class of base nets that are easy to deal with, yet are still interesting. We're going to talk about trees, uh, specifically tree-dependent distributions. So this is a base net, but it's a very special base net because, uh, because it's a tree, every variable has a single parent, OK? So uh, the independent assumption is still holds. X is independent of its non-descendant given its parents, only that there is a single parent. So um, you can think about it. Uh, X is independent of other nodes uh, given the parent Z. Or uh, what else? V is independent of W given U, the parent U, and so on. So again, I can write this in exactly the same way as I've written before, only that the parent of x is a set with one element or no elements in the case of y. Uh, so um, that means that the representation is even simpler than we had before. I basically need to know just two numbers for each edge, p of x given z. Uh, and I need to know the prior on the y, which is the root of the tree. So, so the reason this is an interesting uh, class of base nets is twofold. First of all, inference in this case is efficient. In fact, it's linear in the size of the tree. And there is a very interesting algorithm for learning these probability distributions, this family of probability distribution that we're going to cover uh, next time. So unlike the general case of base net, where everything is intractable, Inference is intractable, and therefore, as you will see, learning that has inference as a sub-routine uh, in it is also intractable. In the case of trees, we can give interesting uh, efficient algorithms, and that's why we're going to do it. So, le so let's start with, uh, with inference. Hmm. OK, so um, oh, by the way, you can easily of course, see that this is the generalization of, of naive base, only that the, the tree is deeper. Um, so what we want to do here is we want to be able to compute the probability of certain events. And rather than giving you a formal algorithm, we're just going to go through a few examples, and you'll be convinced that you can give an efficient inference algorithm in this case. So let's start with computing the probability of, of uh, this x being 1. OK, so I'm taking a leaf. Uh, what is the probability of x being 1? So I can write it as I'm going to condition on the parent z. Now, notice uh, I'm writing here in blue the con some of the conditional probability uh, that we have. We know p of y. We know for each edge p of s given y. and for example, p of x given z. Uh, so because you care about the probability of x being something, I'm going to start by conditioning over z. So I can write p of x being 1 here on the left as p of x being 1 given z being 1 times p of z being 1, plus the same thing when I'm conditioning on z being 0. Um, now, I already know p of x given z here. And I also know p of x given z here. But I don't know p of z. OK? By, say, by, by knowing what I mean, it's part of my input. It's the conditional probability 
distribution. I know P of X given Z, whatever values you put for X and Z, this or that. But now I have to go up recursively on the tree because I need to compute P of Z. Again, I'm gonna condition it on the parent of Z. This is a shallow tree, so I'm already at the root here. P of Z give, being one given Y being one, times Y being, probability of Y being one, and the same thing condition on one being zero times P of Y being zero. Uh, and I can do the same thing for Z equals zero. Now notice that in both cases, now I know everything. Because I know P of Z given Y, this is the conditional probability uh, on this edge. And because I reached the root, I also know P of Y. So I know P of Y being one, P of Y being zero. So clearly, if the tree was a little bit deeper, you would have to continue this. But as you can see, you can just climb up the path from whatever variable you care about, X, to the root. And eventually, you'll be able to write everything in terms of the CPTs. So that's one case. Given a variable, compute the value, the probability of this variable taking a specific value. A second case that we care about, um, uh, we want to look at a joint event. So for example, we care about P of X being one and Y being zero. So again, because it's a tree, uh, in this case, there is a path from X to Y, and I'm going to condition and climb up uh, on this path. So, so I'm going to write it as P of X given Y times P of Y. I can always do this. Uh, and now I'm going up along the path from X to Y. So I'm conditioning or marginalizing uh, using Z. So P of X given Y can be written as P of X given Y and Z times P of Z given Y. And I'm gonna run, of course, we know that X is one, Y is zero, and I'm gonna marginalize this over all the values of Z. Okay, so now let's see what do we already know here. We know, we don't know, uh, okay, let's first simplify. P of X given Y and Z, P of X given Y and Z, uh, I can always write, given my independence assumption, as P of X given Z, All right? So X is independent of Y given Z, and therefore, from this conditional probability distribution, I can drop the Y, so this is P of X given Z, and this is P of Z given Y, and I know all these, okay? So this is given to me in the conditional probability above X, and this is given to me in the conditional probability above Z, so again, I've written this in terms of the CPTs that I know. Um, okay, the final thing I want to know is uh, when I have a joint event without a direct path uh, between the variables. So in this case, I'm choosing X and U. There's no path from X uh, to U. Uh, and if I want to compute this, again, I have to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to climb up uh, and every two nodes in the tree always have, uh, at some point, a joint parent. In this case, it's gonna be very easy to get to Y, but this is true for any two nodes. So in this case, first of all, I'm gonna write it as P of X given U times P of U, and then I'm gonna start uh, climbing up. So Y is a parent of X and U. We always have one, as I said, because we are in a tree. So I'm gonna marginalize over Y. So it's P of X given U and Y times P of Y given U. Uh, and I'm marginal, marginalizing over all the values of Y. We already computed P of X given Y. This is not given to me, right? I don't have a, con a conditional probability table of P of X given Y, but in the previous slide, we computed this. So P of X given Y is known. P of Y given U is uh, 
given to me. I know how to compute it because it's related to the conditional probability table. So again, I've written this uh, given stuff that I already know. So hopefully what I did here without giving you any uh, official uh, or formal uh, inference algorithm, we solved the inference algorithm uh, for trees. We basically showed that we can always eval evaluate the probability of all types of events over trees uh, efficiently, in fact, in a linear time um, in the size of the tree. There are more efficient algorithms, you know, that involve caching and so on, but uh, it's sufficient for us today to just show that, you know, we can do this. Um, so, and again, this is one of the advantage of, uh, of trees. Not, uh, not the case in the general case, because uh, in a tree, there's a single path to get from one node to another, not the case in the general case, and this is where the, uh, the difficulty of you know, exponential algorithm uh, come in. Okay. Uh, I'm actually going to say something about inference, even though I wrote your skip inference. So, um, so as we said, inference learning is hard, because inference is hard, really. Uh, and I want to say a few things about the, the inference problem. Uh, questions before that? Yeah. X and E independently given by? Yes. But again, this is not always easy to do, right? So in a tree, it's easy to do. In general, it's not easy to do. When you look at two variables, you have to satisfy some condition that is called this separation, which I'm not going to talk about. Uh, so, so the condition that I gave is the right condition, the independence condition. But, but verifying given two variables are independent, given something else, is is a procedure that uh, that needs some work. Um, okay, so. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, giving you some ideas of where uh, the issues are with inference. So, so the key exact learning algorithm that people are using is something that is called variable elimination. Now, uh, what the idea is, uh, this is what I've written here is something that you can always do. So I'm writing here the joint, uh, the joint as the product of P of X I given parents. Notice that for simplicity, uh, I'm omitting, if there's a root here that does not have parents, I'm, I can still write it this way by assuming that the parent set is an empty set. So everything falls inside this product here. Uh, now, if I care about x1, for example, uh, what I can do, given that I have the joint, is I can marginalize over the all, all the other variables. And as we said before, this is exponential, but in general, that's what you have to do, right? Uh, I can also rewrite this uh, by uh, factoring the sum if you want. I can sum over xn and then over x n minus one and so on until I get to sum over uh, x2. That's always uh, that's always the case. So basically, I just rewrote this joint as the product here, and then I factor the sum as kind of uh, a sequence of sums. Now, uh, in variable elimination, basically the idea is to try to find interesting orders of the sum that cut some of the computation. Um, so I'm going to look at this uh, and try to reorder the sum in such a way that some independence or some variable basically disappear or can be cached, um, and I'm going to save computation. In general, it's not going to save anything. The algorithm in general is, uh, is exponential, uh, but uh, under some conditions, we can do something. So let's take a simple example. So, so here is my base net. It's the same base net that I showed at the beginning with x, y, and z. Now it's a, b, and c. I want to compute the probability of p of c. Uh, so I can write it in general this way. 
I'm summing over A and B, marginalizing A and B by summing over A and B, P of A, B, C, and then I'm factoring what is P of A, B, C, given this structure, given this structure, P of A, B, C is P of A times P of B given A times P of C given B, right, which is what I've written here. Okay, now I can always change the order here, doesn't matter whether it's sum over A first and sum over B later, or, so I'm gonna do this. And the reason I wanna do this is because notice that uh, C can be taken outside of the sum over A. This P of C given B is independent of this internal sum here. And this is where I'm gonna save. So I'm gonna call this function, this is really a function uh, of uh, A that can, get, can take a value when I instantiate B. So I can call this F A taking the value, taking the argument B. So, uh, so now I can write P of C as sum over B, P of C given B with some function a fixed function, if you want, uh, of A. So essentially, I've eliminated A from the computation. Uh, what have we saved? Basically, we saved a little bit in the number of uh, multiplications and products, uh, multiplication and additions that we have to do, because we can cache the function F A for various values of B. We can do it uh, at the beginning. Uh, and then in the computation, in the inference itself, we're gonna save some time. So basically, this is variable elimination. It's a sequential process that is given an ordering of the variables to eliminate. For each variable that is not in the query, in this case, we cared about C. Uh, so for those variables that are not in the query, we replace it with a function, uh, basically marginalize a variable out, uh, and we can cache some of the computation. Um, now, we cannot do it all the time, as I said, you know. Would be a worst case situation where basically you, you actually have to do everything. Um, you can do the same thing for this. I'm not gonna do it, this is gonna take some time, but I've included the details of eliminating a variable in this case. Remember that for this case we already showed that the joint probability can be factored this way. Uh, and you can also reorder it and do variable elimination on this example, which will take uh, a few minutes. But basically the idea is, as I said, if you know which order of the variables to choose, uh, it's gonna save you some of the computation. The complexity of the problem is not gonna change uh, a lot. Uh, so in my example here, I'm choosing to compute P of M and J given B, uh, and you can follow uh, this elimination. I'm gonna skip it, it's gonna take a long time. Um, okay. Okay, um, so as I said, the complexity doesn't change. The worst case is still intractable. Um, and, uh, but there are good algorithms today for exact inference in BaseNet, even for relatively large uh, BaseNets. Okay, so, however, in many cases, people resort to approximate inference, uh, and the standard way of doing it uh, is something that is called Gibbs sampling. And again, I'm not gonna go into the technical detail, but I, I do wanna give you an idea. So, so let's assume what you wanna do is to compute the area of this weird shape here. Right, so you don't have a good definition of this shape. It's not, you know, a regular uh, shape. How would you compute the area of this? Any idea? Yeah? Yeah, that, that's a good idea. So you can put it on a grid or break it to other other things. Uh, 
and try to approximate it, kind of like the way you compute integrals numerically, uh, and that's a good solution. Let's assume that you have a procedure that can tell you whether a point in this rectangle that I drew around it is in the shape X or not. Yes? Randomly sample points and then record how many are in the shape or not in the shape proportion. Right. So now, excellent. So, so now, if you have this procedure that tells you this point is in X or not, you can sample point from the rectangle, check whether they are inside X or not. Once you do uh, enough samples, uh, you can just take the proportion of those that happen to be inside X, divide it by the size of the rectangle, and you have the area of this rectangle. And that's actually a very useful and simple procedure, right? All you have to have is this condition that tells you inside X or not inside X, which is often available to you. And that's Gibbs sampling. So in general, though, this is a flat uh, rectangle, right? So it, you think about it as uniform sampling of the rectangle, but in general, you'll have a probability distribution here. So, so think about it as a three-dimensional thing that goes into the class. So you don't just sample uh, uniformly from the rectangle, but if you are able to sample from the probability distribution, you can use the same procedure, and you will find um, the area of X. And that's basically the idea of, of uh, estimating the probability of X which is what we really want, not the area, the probability of X. Uh, the probability of X is just the expectation of this sampling function. Uh, and that's what uh, Gibbs sampling is doing. So we want to be able to generate instances from the joint, count, and then we have the probability of X. The key difficulty is how to generate instances, uh, and this is all the technical work under Gibbs sampling is in how to generate good instances from a probability distribution. Um, and, uh, and there are many ways of doing it. I'm not going to uh, talk a lot about it. Basically, the idea is that you uh, define some procedure of following points in this. It's something that is called Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo Markov chains that allows you to sample randomly from this probability distribution. Uh, and again, we're not going to talk about these details, but um, if you want, I've left some slides that provide some details. Um, okay, so where are we? We talked about base nets. We understand what base nets are. Uh, we talked about inference a little bit. So you know that it's hard in the general case. Uh, and there are two procedures, uh, one for exact inference, one for approximate inference. Uh, what we want to be able to do is we want to address the learning. Uh, and the learning uh, we're going to address only in the case of three dependent distribution that we've shown before. So what is the learning problem? Uh, given data, n tuples, assumed to be sampled from a three dependent distribution. Um, okay, so that's actually a, a big statement here. But what does that mean? That I'm assuming that my data came from a three-dependent distribution. What, so, so what is the process that you have in mind when I tell you, here is data, it's been sampled from a three-dependent distribution. How, how would you sample Let's assume that you do have a three-dependent distribution. How do you sample data from it? Yeah? It's a sample y, given the distribution for y, and the sample all the children of y using the condition, the distribution which I already knew. And yeah. So, so, so basically, you follow the structure of the three and the conditional probability tables. You sample the value of y according to py, Boolean variable. So let's say it's 0 0.71, 0 0.30, you got a value for y. Now you need to assign values to w, u, z, and s. And you do this given p of s given y, you already know y. 
So you have the probability of S being 0 given Y, S being 1 given Y, and the same thing for Z, U, and W. Once you have these values, you can go to the lift and so on. So, so basically, it's a generative process. That's why we call this uh, uh, generative process, because we essentially generate the data by following the tree. So, so we understand what does it mean to sample uh, data according to this. So that's uh, now, once we do this, we want to be able to, uh, once we have the data, and people told us it was generated based on a tree-dependent distribution, we want to be able to find this tree-dependent distribution. And again, the question is, what does that mean, find? So, because maybe for a given data, there, there could be many distributions that could have generated this specific data set. So what do I mean when I say find the tree representation of the distribution? Is it exactly the same as running the base, what we did in home size? So basically, for example, if you want to estimate probability of y, just count the number of examples which have y as some value, and you'll be able to estimate the probability of y. And do the same thing for w set. This uh, counting sort of thing. Yes, only that it's not so simple, right? So. So essentially, what, you, what, do you, what do I mean when I say find the tree representation? I can write down many trees, and I have data. What is the tree representation of this distribution? Oh, you don't know the edges of the tree. Let's assume that I know everything. I give you multiple trees. Uh, there's a very large number of trees. I don't even want to write down all of them. But many of them could have generated this specific data set, right? So, so it's a probabilistic process, right? You generated Y. It could have been 1, could have been 0. Maybe 1 is more likely, but you could have seen 0. And then you generate S, Z, Y, and W, and, and so on. That's one data, set, one data element. And then you keep on going. You generate 1,000 data elements like this all with this procedure. So there could be many trees that have generated this data set, right? So, so what do I mean when I say find the tree dependent distribution? Most likely tree dependent distribution. Right, so, so, so just like we've done before, we, we want to find the most likely tree. So here is a data set. Uh, here is a tree. I can compute the probability of the tree given this data set. Here's another tree. I can compute the probability of that tree given this data set. And I want to find the most likely one. So just like it's a generalization of the coin problem that we had, right? So you see 10 tosses, uh, and I can ask you which of these coins is more likely to have generated this sequence of 10 tosses. Both of them could possibly have generated it but one is more likely than the other, and that's exactly the game that we want to put. So, so I want to find the most likely one given the data. So the probability of the tree given the data, Bayes' rule says, is the probability of the data given the tree times the probability of the tree divided by the probability of the data, and, and that's basically what we're going to do, right? So, so essentially, even if we're going to assume prior over the trees, so really, it becomes the maximum likelihood approach. Uh, so in order to maximize, maximize the probability of the data, the tree given the data, and all I need to do is to maximize the probability of the data given the tree. So that's what I'm going to do. So the, the most likely tree is going to be argmax over all trees, p of d given t, which uh, is argmax over t, product over all the data that I've seen, because I'm assuming that each data element, each tuple, is generated independently of others, probability of this data element given this specific tree. Um, so in particular, this shows you why we had to talk about inference first, because as a step in learning, we need to do inference, right? We need to be able to compute the probability of uh, a data point or uh, an event. Okay, so, so that's the problem that we have, right? So uh, we want to be able to uh, 
use the maximum likelihood approach to compute the probability uh, of the data given the tree. So um, now this is exactly what we've done for naive Bayes, only that we didn't say this way. Right? We first factored it, and then we said, let's find the most likely for each edge, but it's exactly the same tree. We found actually the most likely structure, the most likely tree, if you want, shallow tree, but still tree for naive Bayes. So let's, let's take an example here. So, so uh, here's the probability distribution. Probability distribution over four variables, right? So, so the way you should read it is you have uh, four variables give rise to 16 data, four Boolean variables give rise to 16 data points. So I'm writing the six data points here in blue, 0, 0, 0, up to 1, 1, 1, 1. And the red are the weights that each of these 16 element gets. Hopefully these red numbers sum to one. Okay, so that's a probability distribution over four Boolean variables. Here's another one. Well, not quite. Uh, I just gave you the structure. In order to make this a well-defined probability distribution, I also need to give you the conditional probabilities. Right, so I need to give you what is P of X4, two numbers. What is P of X3 given X4? four numbers, two independent numbers, and so on. Okay, everyone agrees? So once I give you these numbers, this is a probability distribution. And here's another one. Uh, so uh, both of these are three, are trees, right? Different trees, but trees. Okay? Uh, so now uh, I can ask you some questions. I can ask the question, are these representations of the same distribution? What does that mean? Is it even possible that the answer is yes? Is it because they, are, they look different? What does it mean for two representations to be the same probability distribution? Yeah? That the conditional probabilities, I mean, make sense along every edge of those trees. Okay. That's true, but it's hard to check because I don't know what does it mean to, to make sense. So, so I'm looking for a more concrete condition of this probability distribution is the same as this probability distribution. Even though the representation are different, right? So all these three representations look differently. But remember, what is a probability distribution? It's just a function, right? It's a function that makes a tuple of size four in this case, x1, x2, x3, x4, to a number between zero and one. So what does it mean to, to, for two functions to be the same? I guess many people know, yes? Two functions are the same if they, are, they get the same value on each argument, right? So, so basically, if the probability distribution here, uh, when I feed it 0, 1, 0, 1 is 0 0.1, I need these two holds for the other probability distribution, right? So, so they agree on each one of the assignments, okay? That's, that's basically what it means. So I should be able to compute that if you want me to prove that x2, p2 is the same as p3. So that's one question. And, and you have to think about it and make sure that you agree with this definition because I'm going to ask you this question. Uh, in fact, it's one of the questions uh, in homework five. We can ask another question. I'm going to give you a sample. And I'm going to ask you which of these probability distribution have generated it. This is closer to the learning problem, right? But you could tell me that this problem is ill-defined because maybe all of them could have generated it. 
So really I should have asked which one is more likely to have generated it. That's a more, uh, that's a well-defined problem. So let's, let's just try it. Here are three data points. 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. And I'm asking you if this is the data, which of these is the target distribution? Really what I'm asking, which of these is more likely to have generated this data? Okay? So what do you think? How about P1? Why not? One zero one one. One zero one one. This. Yes. Is zero. Ah, uh, so it could have, could not have generated this data set. So it's not P one. Okay, everyone agrees. So the likelihood that P one has generated this data set is zero. The other two are still valid. So so let's start with this, and I agree with you. Uh, I'm using computing this way, the probability of T given D using Bayes' rule. Uh, and I know that it's sufficient for me, given that I'm assuming that these three are uh, uh, a priori uh, uniformly likely, that I compute P of D given T. And as you said, P of 1, 0, 1, 1 given the T is 0. And therefore, the probability of the data given this table is 0. Yeah, again, I'm assuming that these data points, these three, four tuples, were generated independently. So it's not this. We can compute the same for P2. Uh, in order to do it, I need to give you the exact number for P2. Uh, so I'm computing this here. So I'm giving you, this is how we define P2 completely. I need to give you P of x4, which is the root here. Uh, just one number defines it. Make sure that you agree with me that this is a complete definition of the probability distribution. Here I'm giving you P of x1 given x4, uh, P of x1 being 1 given x4 being 0, and P of x1 being 1 given x4 being 1. I claim that these two, num these two numbers are sufficient to define this probability distribution, uh, the one on the left here. There are four numbers, but these two numbers are sufficient because the others can be determined uh, by summing to one. And the same thing I'm doing for uh, x2 uh, and x3. So these seven numbers, seven independent numbers, completely define P2. Uh, and now I compute the probability of this data set. Three data points. Uh, hopefully the math here is right, you can check. And by multiplying this, I got the probability of the data given the tree. I did the same thing for uh, P3, and the outcome is that probability distribution two is, most, is the most likely one to have produced this data set. Everyone agrees with, with this procedure? So basically, I solve the learning problem, or I solve one version of the learning problem. So um, basically, we are now in the same situation that we were a few weeks ago when we tossed a coin and we said, oh, there are two options. It's either a fair coin or a bias coin, 0.7.3. Uh, let's toss it a few times and choose which one is more likely. Okay? Just a more complex model, but it's the same problem. Now, that's not the interesting problem, right? So in real life, you're not gonna have just three trees or just two options for the bias of the coin, but rather, you'll have, in, uh, in the case of the coin, infinitely many trees. In the case of the tree, also infinitely many trees. I mean, finite number of structure, but with the probability distribution, infinitely many options for trees and you want to figure out which one is the most likely without trying them. So what we want is we want a systematic way of searching this family of trees so that given data, I can find the most likely tree. 
exactly the same situation we were in when we tossed the coin. Everyone is with me here? Okay, so next time what we're gonna do is we're gonna solve this problem. Basically, we're gonna generalize these three trees to the case of all trees and see that given data, we can actually find efficiently the most likely tree that has produced uh, this data. Questions? Okay, so see you Wednesday. Say it again. Uh, I mean, uh, for the first question you asked um, about the tree has the same distribution, uh, the repeat, uh, yeah, they repeat, they have the same distribution. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it means they, they are the same, they generate the data point that has the same probability generated those three. Yes. And also, uh, I go through the paper you give me, and uh, one question, does it mean like uh, the, if the um, Conditional independence is satisfied. The naive players will generate the optimized one. If the, uh, say it again. I mean, uh, if uh, in that uh, in that example, because the uh, conditional independence are violated, so the uh, the linear function generated by the naive players is not optimized. Uh, no, the, the, we, we assume that we just use the naive base algorithm yeah. on all the data. So what we generate is the correct naive base assumption, the, the correct naive base hypothesis. But what we show uh, is that this is not. Uh, the original function that has generated the data, right? So, so the original function cannot be learned using the naive base on this data. Yeah, it, it's this because the uh, independent, uh, independent, independent, conditional independence is violated. Uh, that's true. Right, that's so, true. if it's not violated, it will generate the uh, optimal. Right, but that that uh, but that wasn't the question. But the question was, here's a linear function. Uh, I'm generating data according to this linear function. Yeah, and uh, I learned the data through naive but naive learned. No, no, I'm learning a function from this data through naive base, and it's not giving me back the original function. Yeah, yeah, I see. It. Yeah. Okay, I got. It. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So the CP, yeah. So so you also signed up this semester. Right? Yeah, I already signed up this semester, and I'll email you the summary uh, in maybe next week. Okay, before the 19th, I need, I need to have the summary. Sorry, what? Before the 19th. 19th? Yeah. Okay. This is yeah. when I have to give the grade. So, yeah. uh, so you're staying with the same company? Yes. Okay. You like it? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Sure. Yeah. In fact, yeah, that's what I'm saying. By the way, I sent last night an email. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, yeah, some guidance on how to write. I can also help you because I didn't have a chance to write anything. Actually, so this is only my first time writing alone. Yeah, yeah, so, so basically, take the, I kind of gave you a skeleton uh, and, and start writing. So, so I think the key question now to ask is. What are we doing here? Yeah. So, so 
it seems very interesting, but what is interesting? Right? So, uh, and actually, I haven't completely decided uh, why is this interesting. Right? So, so let's assume that the basic, the basic uh, phenomenon, which is the context doesn't matter at all, or oh, okay. matters less than people think. Significantly less. Uh, why is this interesting? Uh, uh, and, and I think we have to discuss this a little bit, right? So, um, and also the question is, what other claims can we make? Uh, given this? Uh, actually, we saw a uh, large paper the, from F2A. Uh, I think they also did one experiment where they did not give it any context. It wasn't exactly similar, it was a similar setting. So, I think they also know that even without giving the context, you can get oh, okay. significant. I think, uh, yeah. What, what do they show in this case? I, I forgot actually, I just checked it out. But yeah, so they, one of the settings is such that you do not give it any context. Oh, actually you do not give it any context and you do not give it the question. You just ask it, you just give it the answer that you ask it today. Okay, so it's not exactly what we say. What, what, what that just shows uh, basically some prior distribution. Okay, okay. So they just want to show that we have not overfitted the data. And they show that this is okay, it's yeah. like 25%. Yeah. Okay. But, so if our uh, difference between yeah, the, this setting of theirs and our setting is that we also provide them the question. Right. And in that, it uh, provides around 50%. Yeah, so, so this is, this is twice the box that. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and I think the more interesting question was asked by the results, which gave us like 18%, which was that it's just keep on repeating the question in the context. It will drop to one third. So, what does that mean? I think that, so one very strong indicator is given to me is that it does not understand language at all. So it, it, if it doesn't understand the meaning of question marks, so what I do is the, an, uh, the answer choices are, were modified such that they are the last four to five uh, words of the question itself. So most of the time that also includes a question mark. So the answer option has a question mark in it and even then it selects that. Itself. What if you just put the question itself? Everything. As not the, only the five last words. I haven't tried that but I think it will be too long so maybe it will... Oh, because the so context. What, exactly. So what I did is I took the exactly, so I measured the number of words that are in the correct answer option, description, and that many words I took from the end of the question, and I gave it that. As the context. And as the answer description. The context was 20, 20 times, just uh, append the question. The 20 times. Oh, just append the question. Yeah. If you leave the options as is, and just append the questions in the context. Then it was around 40%. Less. So, okay, so basically the setting is this. So, question, no context, options, 50%. Yes. 50%, yes. Question, uh, question is a context, yes. options, 40%? Yes, I think so. Oh, wow, that's interesting by itself, right? It basically, it's 10% is a lot, Yes. right? So, basically, just duplicating the question. It takes it from, say, 40 to 18%. It Can you do the same thing without changing the option? Just yeah, fix, sure. fix the option and okay. just change the context. Yeah. Uh, from empty all the way to, I don't know, 20 times or whatever it is. Okay. Uh, now, that shouldn't change it yeah. at all, right? It be, and if it changes from 50 to 18... I expect it to change again, to 25. Okay, 25, it's still okay. It's random. 25 is random. And again, I don't know how to articulate what does that mean, but clearly it means that it's not doing what you think it does. Is there a way to exploit this lack of understanding to get better results? So, uh, yeah, so again, so we discussed the, uh, that. Uh, so you just take the correct answer options context and just give it to all the context. That raises the performance to 76% from 67%. So you take the context of the right one. And just give it, give all the options that same context. Oh wow, that's interesting. So essentially the IR kind of found good context. For the correct one. For the correct one. And we did not so let it uh, so the confusion, we removed the confusion factor, right? Yes, so so just the, the correct uh, man was given for all the options.
Okay, so, so what we need to think about is, is kind of an argument and then a sequence of the experiments that will follow this argument. I think this is all interesting. I'm just finding it uh, difficult to articulate. Okay. But le let's, let's think more about it uh, in the evening and see. Uh, yeah, very interesting. Very mysterious. Yes. <laughs> so, so I talked with, with uh, Pete Clark earlier when I was at AI2, and he was actually very impressed with the fact that he can change stuff, but now I don't remember where he changed stuff. He would change adjectives, for example, and he, he said that it impacts the results. So it's kind of like what we did with strong and weak on the demo. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, uh, so he felt that that's a good indication for the model, but exactly, I don't know what... The way I understand it is, it is able to understand words, maybe even phrases, but when you give it sentences and sequence of sentences, maybe it's not able to articulate that better. Do you mention your entire sequence? Have you managed to use the big Roberto? Yeah. No, so the thing is, I, uh, I gained the access from... Uh, so over the weekend, but when I tried to create a project, it, it was saying that uh, your stuff finished or that sort of thing. I just checked and Hegler has sent me a mail. I'll just go talk to him and okay. see if that 